invite me to here to the meeting. Um, and what I hope to do tonight is to kind of give you a little bit different perspective of, of something that you're, you know, you may not normally get in these, in the uh, talks is that some, again, from an, a naval point of view of, uh, of the war. Some might say that the blockade was the longest battle of the war lasting pretty much four years. Uh, and uh, anyway, I want to give you, like I say, I want to give you a, a different perspective. Okay, at 4.30 a.m. on 12 April 1861, the report of a gun boomed across Charleston Harbor, signaling the start of the Civil War. A naval expedition consisting of three steam gunboats sent by President Abraham Lincoln arrived off the harbor, but found themselves powerless to support the fort's garrison. After the surrender of the fort, the naval forces carried off the fort's garrison, participating in this momentous event essentially as a witness. Following the fall of Fort Sumter, the nation's attention focused on Lincoln's call to enlist 75,000 militia in the clash between soldiers and civilians in Baltimore. Within hours of the riots, the United States Navy was formally given its first wartime task when President Lincoln proclaimed his intention to blockade the Southern states. All the national excitement created by the riots and Fort Sumter's surrender caused few people to give much attention to this announcement. Consequently, the Navy was launched into the conflict amidst the sea of national crisis and the blockade hardly received any public notice. <laughs> Civil War naval history has been treated much in the same manner. Although historians have devoted more attention to the Civil War than almost any other subject, they have generally treated the United States Navy as a minor player. The Union blockade of the South had a tremendous effect on the Confederate war effort. Tonight, I hope to give you a better idea of the difficulties that the Navy experienced trying to establish an effective blockade, particularly off the Cape Fear River, and also to show some of the intricacies of setting up and maintaining the blockade. <clears throat> In April 1861, when Abraham Lincoln proclaimed his intentions to blockade the South, he did not fully comprehend the role that the United States Navy would play during the war. But Lincoln's call for a blockade probably, uh, it not only created a need for a large Navy, and it, but it might have been his wisest wartime decision. In April 1861, when the war began, the United States was far from strong and was incapable of blockading the entire southern coast. The Navy had only 90 warships. 50 of these were sailing vessels, of which the larger were useful only as receiving and training ships. Of the 40 steam vessels listed, two were unfinished, three were relegated to duty as receiving ships, and three were stationed on the Great Lakes. Eight others, including five steam frigates, constituted the main element of the pre-war American naval strength. And this is the Sabine, this is one of the five frigates. Now these frigates were formidable warships, but because of their deep drafts, they were not good blockaders. And this is because the South had shallow water throughout. The Navy uh, had only three armed vessels ready for service on the Atlantic coast at the outbreak of the war. The remaining vessels in the Navy that were ready or in service were in the Gulf of Mexico or on foreign stations, some of which did not return for six months. Ignoring the fact that he did not have a large Navy, Lincoln declared what was for many months in effect a paper blockade. In the spring of 1861, however, some Naval officials believed that a comprehensive blockade of the entire South would only require as few as 30 vessels. One of the greatest impediments to the Navy, as I mentioned earlier, was the geography of the Southern coastline. It was extremely shallow over its entire length. It contained 189 harbors, inlets, and rivers. And each of these would offer some sort of refuge for a blockade runner. And an efficient blockade would require that all of these be watched at least to some degree. Of course, many of these entrances were too shallow for large vessels. Uh, was, which did restrict their use. Uh, moreover, only a small number of these 189 entrances had railroad connections, and that's what would become the most important. Initially, the Navy Department created two blockading squadrons to guard the co Confederate coastline. The dividing point was at Key West, Florida. In September 1861, four coastal blockade, blockading squadrons were created. The coast of Virginia, North Carolina came under the surveillance of the newly formed North Atlantic 
blockading squadron. The Navy's organization remained under these four squadrons for the duration of the war. It was mostly sailing vessels that tested the Union blockade in the early months of the war. But as the Union Navy was able to deploy more gunboats to blockade the South, vessels powered by wind alone could not be risked. Sailing vessels were generally slower than steamers. They could be seen farther at sea and they were dependent upon the weather and the currents to move. Nevertheless, sailing vessels and particularly fast schooners ran the blockade uh, in some numbers for over two years into the war. And that's just on the East Coast now on the, on the Gulf Coast, they ran it throughout the war. Stopping steam blockade runners developed into the Union Navy's greatest challenge. When the war began, virtually any vessel might be used as a blockade runner. And I put this one up there as, a, as an example of what it was before the war and what it looked like after they trimmed it down and made it a little bit more uh, efficient, uh, you know, efficient as a, as a blockade runner. But gradually, the British built steamships to meet the challenge of a stricter blockade. These new specially designed steamers constructed, were constructed expressively for speed. They usually displaced between 400 and 600 tons, but it was, were as large as 1,200 tons. They were usually built of iron or steel. They sat low in the water. They had extremely narrow beams, had rakish designs, and sometimes had turtle back forward decks to help them drive through the seas. You can see that here. <clears throat> Builders constructed both screw and side wheel vessels, each having its advantages. Twin screw steamers became common toward the war's end, perhaps because they made little noise, were more maneuverable, and were less vulnerable to gunfire. The paddle wheel steamers, on the other hand, could operate in shallower water, were easier to extract from shoals, and were slightly faster than the screw propelled vessels. Avoiding detection was singularly the most important characteristic necessary for the success of the blockade runners. In many cases, they carried only a, only a light pair of lower masts with no yards. A small crow's nest on one of the masts often appeared as the only alteration from the ship's sharp outline. The hull showed little above the water and was usually painted a dull gray to camouflage the vessel. Blockade runners, however, were also painted other colors. And in some instances, the colors approached the pinkish hue. Now the British used the pinkish hue during World War II, it was called Mount Batten Pink. And you can note the blue here, and I've not really confirmed that this was painted like this, but, but I did get this out of a, a good source. That's a measure 22 paint scheme from World War II. It's the same thing as a measure 22. Some steamers had telescoping, telescoping funnels, which could be lowered to the deck which helped them maintain lower profile. The blockade runners also used anthracite coal, uh, which uh, made little or no smoke. When approaching shore, these vessels blew their steam off underwater, showed no lights, and sometimes muffled their paddle wheels with canvas, all to avoid detection. High profits were the incentive that lured the foreign businessmen into the trade. A single round trip might allow profits enough to pay for both cargoes and the vessel. These high returns ensured that the trade would continue. A clerk in the Confederate War Office commented about one in every four steamers is captured by the enemy. We can afford that. James Randall, a clerk in a blockade running firm here in Wilmington agreed. He said, bad luck is expected occasionally, but the percentage of profit is largely in favor of the Confederate steamers. Nearly everyone that has, had been captured had paid for herself half a dozen times. A well-handled steamer might uh, make a round trip once a month, but they could do it in as little as eight days if they had cargoes on both, both ends. <clears throat> Some of the vessels ran through the blockade as regularly as packets. Uh, several things made their trips irregular, uh, conditions of the blockade, the weather, mechanical conditions, uh, quarantines, cargo, availability, the moon and the tide. You know, these are some of the things they had to worry about. And this basically just gives you a perspective of how really kind of smallish these vessels were. Uh, you see how, how long and narrow this, this vessel is. And this one I wanted to show you, and this is, this is what really uh, made the blockade uh, much less effective. 
is you see in this vessel here that the the engines take up from this port to this port with in coal bunkers and so you only have cargo here and here so it's a very un inefficient way of trying to run cargo into the south stevedores loaded these vessels to util to utilize the small carrying capacities these experts packed the cotton so close that a mouse could hardly find room to hide itself. They placed cargo in every conceivable place fore and aft inside and on the weather deck. The Stevers doors left only openings to the cabins, engine room, and so forth. One blockade running captain claimed that loaded in this way, the vessels looked like a huge bell of cotton with a stick placed upright on the end of it. The steamer advance attempted to carry so much cotton out of Wilmington on one occasion that she tried eight times to steam past the blockaders and had to, had to turn back each time. Before her ninth attempt, she unloaded 300 bales of cotton and then successfully eluded the gunboats. With all the natural advantages that the blockade runners possessed, it became increasingly evident that the blockade could not be maintained effectively with slow steamers. The Navy at the outbreak of the war had purchased nearly every merchant vessel that it could. In most cases, and this is the Hepsil I'll show you is an example of this, they were not fast vessels. Uh, they were never intended to be vessels of war and they made less than adequate blockading vessels. And of course they're uh, against blockade runners that were uh, built specifically to elude blockade, the, you know, the, the blockaders. Charleston early in the war, developed as the South's major blockade running port, but it was Wilmington, North Carolina that became the South's most active port. No one had any idea at the war's beginning that Wilmington would become the South's most important port and would become synonymous with the word blockade. For nearly four years, the Union Navy attempted to stop the trade at Wilmington. It increased the number of vessels that watched the port, designed faster and specialized vessels here, and the naval leaders constantly changed tactics. Despite these efforts, the blockade never became airtight. Before the war, Wilmington was the state's principal seaport, and with a population of nearly 10,000, the state's largest city. It boasted the largest naval stores market in the country, but other than this, it seemed to have no special attribute that would make it important to the Confederacy. But it was geography that, that helped. That and communications more than any other factor would determine Wilmington's growth and importance. Wilmington had rail connections to Charleston and Richmond, which linked it to two of the South's most important cities. Wilmington lay 20 miles from the mouth of the Cape Fear River and 15 miles from New Inland. And this is beyond the reach of a direct naval assault by Union gunboats. Smith's Island was pos positioned between the two navigable entrances and stretched for six miles into the ocean. In addition, frying pan shoals extended over 15 miles farther into the Atlantic, making the distance by the inlets by sea almost 50 miles, while the distance between them was only six or seven. The double inlets required two separate blockading forces to watch the coast and made it possible for the blockade runners to sit in the river and observe the blockading fleet at their stations and then choose the weakest guarded inlet to uh, give them a better chance of success. The separation of force of the Union Navy compounded many of the problems, especially communications, coherence, and support. After Bermuda and Nassau became the major shipping points for blockade goods, Wilmington became even more convenient. Large ships brought contraband cargoes to these island ports where the merchandise was transshipped and into the smaller, faster blockade runners. Only 570 miles from Nassau, a steamer could travel to Wilmington in 48 hours. Bermuda, at only 674 miles from Wilmington, uh, allowed a steamer to get to make the trip in about 72 hours. Well, Wilmington was left virtually unwatched for three months after Abraham Lincoln announced the blockade. During this period, Blockaders cruised along the coast and some stopped off of Wilmington, but they never officially declared the port to be under blockade. You see, at this time, you, to declare a port under blockade, you actually have to send a note ashore to the, to the authorities, and, it, and then they get about two weeks to get every, 
all the ships have two weeks to get out of the port legally. Well, on 21 July, 1861, the 432-ton wooden steamer Daylight sent a message ashore, formally declaring this port uh, blockaded. And then you can see this is just another uh, ex-merchant vessel. Uh, of course, this single steamer could not guard both inlets and several times was forced to watch as one vessel uh, slipped out of the opposite side of frying pan shoals. Of course, the rebels made this job even more difficult for the daylight because they started hoisting flags on the Ballhead Lighthouse, which broadcast the, the whereabouts of the daylight. During the first two years of the war, the blockaders at Wilmington remained at anchor. Most of the, the large blockade vessels had lofty mast and rigging, which portrayed their positions to the blockade runners long before their hulls were visible. The Union Naval officers referred to their gunboats as buoys and floating beacons, and lookouts on the blockade runners could spot the rigging uh, of the larger gunboats miles before the ship, and sailing vessels could be seen two miles farther uh, on the station uh, than, than just uh, steamers. At night, the blockade runners also used the uh, senior officer ship for guidance because they knew this warship generally showed lights to the other ships in the blockading force, and they used this light to guide themselves to the entrance. Noises also betrayed the blockaders' positions. They were the blockade blockaders were supposed to be kept in perfect silence. Uh, the bells, they didn't ring the bells. They were, the times were supposed to be reported to the officers and, not, and the bells not struck. Yet running pumps and other machinery, machinery often revealed the position of the blockading vessels. Well, maintaining the blockade did become increasingly dangerous for the blockaders as the war progressed. There were growing threats from Confederate ironclads and commerce raiders. And this did have an impact on the blockade. The threat of commerce raiders and ironclads created a situation where many of the blockading vessels were overgunned to handle these threats. Uh, and as, as, as I've been pointing out, since there are, most of these vessels are, are ex-merchant vessels they were, and not designed to be warships, uh, adding guns on, on the upper deck just, just did not work very well in, in a lot of cases. Uh, many of these Union vessels also had their machinery and boilers, uh, you know, above deck, and it made them vulnerable to enemy gunfire. And those that carried very heavy batteries uh, made less than efficient blockaders. They were frequently unmanageable in heavy seas, uh, and this uh, left the guns unworkable, and sometimes it even endangered uh, the vessels. And particularly, it, it compromised the speed of of the blockading vessels. The well, threat of ironclads had a huge psychological impact on the Union officers. They frequently showed great concern that they uh, about being attacked. The ironclad Raleigh sortied from the Cape Fear and attacked the blockading fleet. Uh, and after this, the site of the, uh, when lookouts even spotted a small steamer, uh, in the, in the uh, river, word would be passed from man to man and it gradually grew until it was a sighting of a, of a Confederate ironclad ram. And this had a effect on even the most unshakable Union officers. Uh, the men called this ram fever. And one officer commented, it has been ram, 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 till as one of the officers remarked the other day, the very atmosphere was impregnated with the smell of mutton. Well, at Wilmington, with the Union vessels divided on either side of frying pan shoals, it meant that if they were attacked by an ironclad, they couldn't, one side couldn't support the other. Well, to contend with the ironclad attacks, some of the blockaders were fitted with spar torpedoes, similar to the one pictured here. These, these weapons were placed on the pole between 15 and 20 feet long, and they carried 150 pounds of powder with fuses that projected from the head of the weapon. They were often more of a danger to the blockading vessel than to any ironclad ram that would ever attack, uh, and particularly when there was heavy weather. The vessels that carried these, these weapons were slower, and they had to, everywhere they went, they had to proceed with caution. 
Uh, they were certainly not capable of catching a speedy blockade runner. Thus, the presence of uh, Confederate naval vessels directly influenced the maintenance of the blockade. Well, there was no complicated tactical positioning for the blockaders at Wilmington until Samuel Phillips Lee took command of the squadron in the fall of 1862. Now I put this in here because I wanted to kind of you to kind of see the, if you, the different kinds of vessels that were on the squadron. It's just a kind of a piebald force of all kinds of vessels. Uh, again, uh, some uh, Wilmington eventually got some special built gunboats, but these are all mostly merchant vessels that were have been converted. Well, before Lee takes command, the vessels remained at anchor during the day and usually hauled offshore at night and anchored again. And when a blockade runner was spotted, the ships had to slip their anchors and sometimes the engineers had to get the engines in motion. If the blockade runner was fast, she'd be gone long before the Union vessel could react appropriately. The tactical positioning continually improved as naval leaders learned just how the blockade runners avoided capture. At Wilmington, one of the earliest departures from simply anchoring off the entrances was utilized just a few months after Lee took command. On the northern side of the, of the uh, inlet here, of the, of the two inlets, this is, this is a new inlet. Lee instructed one vessel to take a position close to the bar and station another near shore another in order to cut off vessel running up the coast. That'd be this one here. A lot of times the blockade runners would try to run uh, as close to the surf as they could, figuring the, the noise and everything would drown out their machinery. And a third vessel took position on the seaward approach. All the gunboat, uh, all the gunboats anchored at the positions after dark and left them before daylight to avoid being seen by the shore batteries. Between mid-December 1862 and 15 January 1863, the number of vessels at Wilmington increased from eight to 15. In March 1863, Lee instructed his officers to keep their vessels as close to the inlet bars as possible during the night so that if they, if they discovered a blockade runner, they would be ready for a chase. The senior officers sometimes had only, had only large ships for this duty, and the larger ships were not suited for this work because their deep drafts would not let them, them approach close to shore. Also, the larger ships, because of their rigging, could be more readily seen by the blockade runners who could then steer to avoid them. The only advantage that the larger ships had was in heavy weather. Vessels such as the Connecticut shown here could drive through heavy seas during a chase and readily overtake a blockade runner in, in harsh weather. Well, to solve the problem of vessels that were too prominent, Admiral Lee sent steam tugs to Wilmington. The Aeolus was in a class of vessels used as bartenders at Wilmington. They were small, massless steamers, had good speed and light armament and patrolled about one and a half miles from the beach. In May, 1863, Lee moved some of the gunboats farther from the inlets and had the screw steamer Nifon cruise on a 30 mile arc to catch violators farther at sea. By that November, the three fastest vessels cruised from 30 to 70 miles offshore, each cruising in a line 60 miles long. Sometimes the lack of vessels kept the senior officers from using the, these cruisers on the patrols, however. In December 1863, Lee added another line of cruisers to his blockade. He stationed the Florida 100 miles southeast of Frying Pan Shoals and a week later added the Quaker City to this outer line. Lee then reconfigured his tactical pos positions by establishing six primary day stations for the vessels close in, three at each inlet. The remaining gunboats lay between the primary stations and divided the space. Now this is a little bit, uh, this slides a little bit uh, close in just so you, you can see kind of what was going on. At night, a, sl a slower steamer guarded the bar and a faster one hauled offshore about five miles past the senior officer. Well, despite this, the gunboats still remained from one half to five miles apart. And at times lookouts could not see 50 yards due to the fog and the darkness. Dark nights created a situation that lookouts could not see vessels one half mile away and under favorable circumstances in the absence of moonlight, uh, one could not see a vessel a mile off. 
one of the masters of the blockade runners claimed that at night the gunboats might pass within 100 yards of the steamer without knowing they were there. And weather particularly favored the blockade runners coming out of the inlets because they could choose not only the best time to make their escape, but they could also choose the most weakly guarded inlet. Gales from the southeast caused the blockaders to leave their post until the wind diminished, which then this allowed the blockade runners clear access in and out of the southern inlet. One officer wrote, it is greatly to our mortification after all our watchfulness to prevent it that the enemy succeed in eluding us. None can be more vigilant than we are. Another officer lamented he was frequently on deck at night inspecting the lookouts in person and taking what sleep he could get in his clothes ready for a moment's call. And he said he believed this was the same way for all commanding officers. Paymaster William Keeler, who was on board the Florida, remarked, we began to appreciate the difficulties of keeping a thorough blockade. Let no one condemn the occasional running in or out of a vessel till they have experienced some of the difficulties of preventing it. He added, you may imagine our vessels scattered along from two to four miles apart. What is there to prevent a vessel from running between them in the darkness when it is impossible to see more than three to 400 feet from the ship? Well, since stealth had proved to be an extremely important attribute for the blockade runners, the blockade blockaders adopted a similar policy. To help avoid being seen by the blockade runners, the blockaders were also given a coat of of paint, a dull lead color, just like the blockade runners. Lee had the mast and the yards of the smaller gunboats guarding the bars removed to cut down on their profile. In fact, uh, some of the most successful blockading vessels and the fastest were the ex-blockade runners. And here's pictured the, the Robert E. Lee, which was later renamed uh, the Malvern and served off of Wilmington. In January 1864, the steamer Sassacus, shown here, and the Pequot joined the outside blockade to intercept inward bound blockade runners hovering off Cape Lookout. The commanders stationed the ships at a point where the blockade runners would be most likely at dawn. Eventually, Samuel Phillips Lee developed the most advanced tactical system of the blockade. He's smaller, faster vessels and constantly moving vessels uh, in his tactical uh, plan. And he moved the vessels farther from the, from the inlets. Uh, and this shows you, you know, kind of where he was put, putting them during these three periods. In their most advanced form, this system comprised four seaward lines of cruisers. Just off the bars and cl as close as to shore as possible lay the first line called the bartenders. That's these right here. The, these vessels watched the bar and gave a signal if a blockade runner attempted to escape, but these vessels were not to chase. Chasing was the function of the second line of vessels, which supported the bartenders, and that's these here. And these vessels moved back and forth like sentries. The divisional officers and fast gunboats supported the second line. The, the divisional officers, and then outside of this uh, lay the fastest vessels in the squadron. They lay all out here. And these cruised on the outside tracks of the blockade runners. The gunboats figured their positions, concluding that blockade runners normally escaped at night. Thus, the blockade blockaders on the outer line kept low steam in their boilers during the dark hours and in high steam during the day. Lee computed the placement of the outer bar, this outer line, at 160 miles by figuring the distance from the inlets that the blockade runner could steam from twilight to dawn. Well, David Dixon Porter succeeded Lee in command of the squadron, and he did not change Lee's tactical system drastically, but he was given a greater number and better vessels to work with. In fact, he had 50 more vessels than Lee, than Lee had. There were so many vessels blockading Wilmington at one point that one Confederate claimed that the very waves grew tired of holding up their ships. Porter's dis disposition of vessels off Wilmington essentially consisted of three half circles. 
The arc of one line comprising 20 vessels lay close to the bars with frying pan shoals splitting it in half. Another semicircle of 20 vessels lay eight miles apart and 12 or 15 miles from shore just outside of frying pan shoals. The last crescent, 130 miles from land, consisted of vessels 12 miles apart, stretching from Beaufort to south of Cape Fear and comprised the fastest vessels of the squadron. Porter's tactical dispositions were better designed to capture outward bound runners, whereas Lee's was designed for the opposite. Rear Admiral Porter observed about the situation whereby the blockaders waited for the vessel to run in and out. He said, it was very much like a parcel of cats watching a big rat hole. The rat often running in when they expected him to run out and vice versa. The advantage was all on the side of the blockade runners. They could always choose their time. Well, the great majority of the blockade runners chose moonless nights to make their trips to Wilmington. This practice led the officers of the gunboats to steam to Beaufort, North Carolina, to coal their ships on the nights of a full moon. Or, or in, if possible, keep their uh, bunkers full on dark nights. The uh, senior officer allowed the refueling on the bright nights because the blockaders could normally see greater distance. Of course, at this uh, by doing this at times, the blockade at Wilmington was virtually just crippled because so many ships were away for coal. Well, while most of the blockade runners chose moonless nights to make their trips, others made their trips on nights that prov provided some light. One blockade running captain commented that he considered it the less of two evils to run the risk of being seen and chased rather than to make the certain danger of being wrecked when running in insufficient light. In fact, contraband car cargoes became so valuable during the war that runners readily took to the beach when sighted by a blockader. The modern Greece ran aground under the guns of Fort Fisher, North Carolina, and two companies of soldiers from the fort saved two thirds of the cargo. This included 7,000 stand of arms, 2,700 barrels of powder, cloth, clothing, medicines, shoes, wine, spices, brandy, and cannon. Later in the war, comparatively worthless vessels, usually small schooners, might be run aground intentionally and unloaded in the surf. Well, even with the loss of the vessel, it's still usually been a profit to the owners. The beach, block, the beach blockade runners were protected by Confederate long-range artillery that was pulled to the beach. British Whitworth guns that shot a rifle projectile five miles were able to hold Union ships at bay while cargoes were unloaded. Some blockade running captains did not fear to steam directly through the fleet. Blockade runner Captain John Wilkinson remarked, for although the blockade runner might receive a shot or two, she was rarely disabled. And in proportion to the increase of the fleet, the greater would be the danger of firing into each other, making them very apt to miss the cow and kill the calf. The Union Navy's leadership stressed vigilance as a key component for catching blockade runners. One officer reported that he had stayed at his post so often that in 25 days, he never had his clothes off. The Connecticut's crew even raised a fund of $150 to reward the man who discovered a steamer which that Union ship captured. And although the captains emphasized vigilant, it did not take long for the men stationed at women to realize the absurdity of closing the port. One remarked, we began to appreciate the difficulties of keeping a thorough blockade. Let no one contemn, condemn the occasional running in or out of the vessel, out of a vessel, till they have experienced some of the difficulties of preventing it. The most dangerous moment <coughs> on blockade duty was the instant a Union vessel sighted a suspicious vessel. Chaos often prevailed during the first minutes. Unaware if the vessel was a dangerous raider or a blockade runner, the Union ship began the pursuit. They often increased steam and headed into the darkness, not knowing the intentions nor the direction of the enemy. Shots flew in all directions and the Union ships mistakenly shot at the enemy and at each other. They also had collisions of blockade runners here off of Wilmington. Union lookouts remained ready at all times to remove the tarpaulin hoods 
which covered the lights and officers continually peered into the darkness to help avoid collisions. The numerous signals and gunfire that filled the air uh, confused those in command and the blockade runners that seemed 15 miles an hour soon passed out of sight. The Union ships also used rockets, lights, and whistles to signal the courses of blockade runners. But the captains of the blockade runners began using the same objects as ruses to escape. Captain John Wilkinson, the captain of the blockade runner Robert E. Lee, bought rockets from New York. And a few minutes after his pursuer signaled, he would send up identical signals and rockets at right angles to the course of his vessel. This trick became so successful that the Union officers were instructed to use their rockets sparingly. If spotted in daytime, these crafty blockade runner captains raised United States colors, which at a, at a distance often deceived Union vessels. When chased, they would try to pull over uh, out of sight when at dusk, you know, at dusk, and then, you know, put the helm over hard, uh, changing course at right angles to the one they'd been steaming. And from, if you're chasing, and uh, they would often also, often also put up a lot of black smoke. So you, they, they would see the smudge in the distance and then they'd head right or left and, and the Union vessel would follow the, the, the smoke. And, and when they got to the smoke, they'd, they'd find no blockade runner. Well, John Moffat, the captain of several blockade runners, commented in all the, he was commenting about the, the different things he did to uh, get away. He said, nothing in the shape of a steamer was to be trusted. As we entertained the belief that Confederates were Ishmaelites upon the broad ocean, the recipients of no man's courtesy. Well, the chase was the most exciting part uh, and experience for those on board the blockaders. The formality of passing word to the captain and having the crew beat the quarters was repeated so often with no results that in some cases the crew showed little excitement at the announcement. During a chase lasting hours, a Union warship might fire well over 100 shots at the blockade runner, which kept the crew busy. Hours of pursuit, however, frequently ended with no capture. Crafty blockade running captains had weather, darkness, and engine breakdowns that, uh, per, you know, contributed to lost prizes. The Union blockade vessels used extraordinary measures to overtake and capture blockade runners. Some gunboats obtained cords of pine wood and rosin at Beaufort, and they kept it on board to raise a quick pit of steam. In one chase, the Florida dumped overboard a barricade of sandbags that weighed 30 tons, and warships would set, either set all sail or took down everything, their yards, uh, top masts, and everything that would offer any resistance to the wind. They sometimes threw coal overboard to lighten the ship and, and to alter the trim. In addition, the gunboats often had their bottoms scraped and painted and then covered with grease or tallow to allow them to slip through the water with greater ease. The blockade runners also lightened their loads on the inward and outward journeys as a means to escape. Outward bound blockade runners being chased lightened their deck loads by pitching bales of cotton overboard to avoid capture. Well, even the, the uh, 13 knot cruisers, the Union cruisers had a difficult time catching a blockade runner after they had lightened their load. The slower vessels that had no real chance of, of catching the fast blockade runners all stopped to gather the cast off and floating cargoes. Paymaster William Anderson of the state of Georgia off of Wilmington lamented, we fellows could afford to stop and pick up this cargo and what a struggle there was between the boats of the different ships in the rear of the chase for the possession of this consolatory flotsam. Well, after overhauling a blockade runner, the Union captain's main duty was to keep the prize intact. Arm cutters were quickly dispatched to protect the integrity of the prize. Blockade running crews uh, often tried to destroy their vessels and to prevent the capture, uh, prevent their capture. Confeder the Confederate government owned steamers were ordered to do so. They kept combustible material placed so they could quickly set fire to the vessel and escape. They also cut pipes, secured the boiler safety valves, 
which were designed to cause the pressure to build in the boilers, causing them to explode. Normally, the crews of blockade runners threw overboard the important papers, mail, money, and as much cargo and things of value as they could before the cutters arrived. This practice ceased when they risked being fired upon by the blockaders' guns. The prize money tended to offset the grueling and monotonous duty uh, of the sailors. And after edu education cost, one half of the money went to the Navy pension fund and the other half went to the captors in amounts relative to their normal pay. A particular valuable ship might fetch every member of the vessel several years pay. When the little tug Aeolus captured the blockade runner Hope off Wilmington in 1864, the acting master earned $13,164.85. The assistant engineers uh, 60, over $6,600 each. This amounted to more than four years pay for, all, for, for everybody on the crew. The seaman got over $1,000 a piece and the cabin boy whose pay amounted to less than $2.50 a week received $532. Well, the drawback to this system was the distribution among the officers and men. Slow ships generally caught fewer vessels and their crews received less prize money. William H. Anderson on, the, on board the state of Georgia, a fairly slow ship in the latter part of the war, made $80 in prize money during one season, while officers of, officers of corresponding rank and a fast blockade runner earned $20,000. Rear Admiral Lee, who also got a share of the squadron's prize money, earned an incredible $125,000 during the war, the highest amount of any naval officer. Despite the constant augmentation of, of Union fleets off the coast, the blockade runners continued to successfully evade the gunboats. One sailor lamented, we might as well be in Boston for all the good we do in stopping blockade runners. Not a night passes that some cotton-loaded steamer does not get out and others loaded with guns, etc run in. Well, there's no doubt that a great deal of contraband passed through the blockade. The munitions import virtually sustained the Confederate Army during five years of fighting. One may question just how the blockade damaged the Confederate war effort. During the war, approximately 1,500 vessels of all kinds were wrecked, captured, or destroyed. This amounts to a great loss. Of these 1,500, over 220 of these were the larger steam vessels. And if we look at these vessels only, and they average nearly 300 tons, then the blockade, blockading vessels captured and destroyed about 65,000 tons of cargo. To put this in perspective, an army wagon also carried one ton of supplies, which means the blockaders captured and destroyed an equivalent of 65,000 wagon loads of supplies or nearly 3 million cubic feet of cargo just from these 220 ships. Now, this is a sizable loss. Now, no single cargo was critically important, but added together, it is a huge accumulative effect on the Confederacy. Yet even with these heavy losses, the blockade runners still continued to operate profitably. The high profit margin ensured the continuation of blockade running as long as the vessel had the slightest chance of getting her cargo through. It's obvious the blockade did not keep contraband out of the Confederacy, but it's equally clear that the blockade damaged the Confederate war effort in several ways. Without, without a blockade, the Confederacy would have been free to import every object necessary for the continuation of the war and to export freely cotton to sustain its purchases. The blockade was tight enough to keep all but the most specialized vessels from even attempting to run the run, reach the Confederacy. The South might have solved some of its most crucial problems had the blockade never been implemented. Instead, the South could only import only the most important articles while shipments containing items such as locomotives, railroad iron, and other equipment and machinery necessary to wage war came into the Confederacy in much smaller quantities. The blockade aggravated the monetary system and helped to add to the tremendous rate of inflation and financial problems developed abroad. What's extremely significant <clears throat> was the Union's control of the water. The most often recognized role of the Navy during the war was its maintenance of the blockade. By early 1862, the Union Navy had captured many of the South's major ports, the most effective method 
of a, a way of stopping this trade. The capture of these ports forced the Confederate government to use other less accessible ports and elongated the South's supply lines, making its armies more vulnerable to the successes and failures of ships running the blockade. For the next three years, the Navy watched the coast, stopping only a small percentage of vessels running the blockade. The Union blockade did isolate the South both politically and diplomatically. It also prevented the Confederates from establishing a full-scale war economy. And by early 1865, the South had expended a great deal of its resources to win the war. I, I did want to point out, if, if you see the flames of this in this painting, I, li I really like it because it depicts the first national flag of the Confederacy, kind of in flames. Uh, Yet yeah, most of the officers and men of the ships, they never really comprehended the crucial role that, that they played. For them, the job of blockading was one of hardship, monotony, privation, and sometimes little reward. One seaman, seaman stationed off Wilmington summed up these feelings of helplessness and the Navy's vain attempts to catch the blockade runners when he wrote his parents. A steamer came in and the men on her bridge put their finger to their nose. So you see, that's the way things go on. And I wanted to finish up by pointing out this, this blockade runner. Uh, this is one that Charlie Peary, a good friend of Chris and I, owns. It's, it, the blockade runner is called Let Her Rip, which is just a great name. But her sister ships were Let Her Be and Let Her Go. So just love it. But that's, that's all I had. I'm happy to answer questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Questions? Uh, yes. Sometimes I have a follow-up about the order. I an interesting observation about the order slightly changing S. Phillips Lee's tactics. By the way, you know, Sandy Phillips Lee was Robbie Lee's sixth cousin. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, uh, you said that Lee's uh, objective was to prevent military supplies from being in the Confederacy. Yeah. The order changed that to prevent cotton. Yes, more more money, more prize and money. That's where I was going. Can you talk a little bit about this? Because uh, the, uh, the officer of the crews on board these blockaders uh, provided monetary incentive to capture the vessels, as well as quarter as, as, as the cotton going out, right? Yeah. Going well, if you get if you make more money from uh, vessels loaded with cotton, you know, and they, and we know, both know Porter pretty well, that Porter would do that because Porter was always looking for a way to make money uh, while he was uh, in, the, in the Navy. In fact, he made a comment, this by first professional official, he said, rather than go ahead and launch the campaign, because basically he was being too fat and rich on the top of going out. Yeah. He said, it was starting to look a little suspicious. And I was, my bank account was swelling. Yeah. yeah. Did Coldplay ever become a problem as far as Getting coal well, well, for the North Atlantic Squadron, they 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 used Beaufort as the coal, that was their coaling station, and there were a few times where it got really short there. I don't think it ever I don't think it ever ran out, but it, it got very short there, and, and and that's because they had they had a coal strike at one point in the war, and that uh, uh, slowed things down, and they also uh, uh, the masters had a had a real hard time of, of the master of the coal schooners and stuff. They were they the navy had problems with them throughout the war for for various reasons. They actually tried to coal the vessels off of Wilmington by passing bags across bags of coal across from one vessel to the other. It just didn't work because the the water out there was always so rough that it would knock the vessels to pieces. You know, uh, trying to do that out in, in off of the coast. Yes, sir. Question for me, uh, Kim Winston on, on ice. How much did Porter make in the war? I don't, I don't know. It was less than Lee. Lee made 125,000. The supporters were somewhat less than that, but he, but he also made money uh, in the Mississippi squadron too, and uh, in the Red River campaign made a lot of money. He claimed, I can't quantify this. He claimed he made more than Porter. Yeah, yeah. Well, he, he might. I, I'm just. I, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. I've never seen that. Well, 
So it's not about made, uh, I'm sorry, I said a quarter of a million, but two million. So they have been the equivalent of about what, 35 million now? Wow. <laughs> Yeah. Quarter? He he stayed in the Navy. He, he yeah he. Yeah, yeah. His back his nickname was Black Dave. He was not a well liked man by a, a number of people. He either loved him or hated him. He was just one of those guys. But he would stab you in the back in a heartbeat. I mean, he was one of the most vicious backstabbers in the Navy. He even stab, tried to stab his his foster brother in the back. Farragut was his foster brother. He tried to throw him under the bus one time. <laughs> Long stories. <laughs> <Good>. Yeah. <laughs> How much water did uh, these folks drop from New England to the shallow? They're drawing it probably some, some of the bigger ones, 18, and the small, uh, like the steam tugs, probably eight to 10 at the most. Uh, but uh, that's a lot of water. Yeah, they weren't getting. That's a lot of work. Uh, the big ones weren't getting anywhere near shore. The big ones weren't getting anywhere near shore. But they didn't have any kind of depth fight. No. Well, but they swung a lead. Is what they did. They, just, you know, casting the lead. They get somebody in the in the uh, bow of the boat, and you throw the lead in front of you. And as soon as it gets, you pull it up, and it, and you read off the the uh, depth from that. You know how deep it is when you run aground. Well, yeah, exactly. <laughs> right before you run aground. <laughs> right and of course, they all these leads also had a had a hollow space up in them. It's called, and you put uh, tallow in it. It's called arming the lead, and they could tell what kind of bottom it had, which is also marks you know certain areas of the of the uh, coast. So they could tell not only the depth, but the, what, what kind of bottom it had. How, how much time was it away forward? That seems like it was a big deal. What was the away calling you? Yeah. Well, Beaufort was only a half a day steaming, so they could they could usually get up there in a day and a half, maybe two days. Again, it depends on the you know the, the weather up there, and and sometimes some of these vessels, literally they they were too deep to get into the, over the Beaufort bar, so they'd have to wait there to get over the bar at Beaufort. So, it, it was never easy for the Navy. There was enough. There was it was hard. Schedules were hard to keep sometimes. Because of weather and tides and things like that. Yes. I don't. I don't remember hearing of any really bad. I mean, they had north, you know, northeaster blows and stuff, but no, no hurricane type event. Yes. Come on, John Messer online. Great talk, fascinating. The question is: Was there any real animosity between Union captains when it came to the position for the blockade in regard to opportunities and prize pools? I really haven't seen anything that came out in person because I don't, you know, they, it, it, if there was any displeasure in that, it would be displeasure with, with the commanding officer. And I think they might have, there, there were things said to the commanding officer, but not amongst the, amongst the different captains themselves, their peers. They, I, I don't remember seeing anything negative about one over the other. Were these mostly in Netflix? Yes. Most uh, yeah, pretty much. The Navy was a was a professional service. They didn't have any have uh, politicians that could come in the Navy. In fact, the the uh, uh, they did let uh, volunteers into the Navy that were in the merchant service, but they could only get up to a lieutenant commander position. That's as high as they could go in the, in the Navy at the time. So these were all in uh, you know Annapolis or you know trained by the Navy. That's the off officer corps. You didn't have political admirals. No political admirals. Bob, you, you said that the uh, captured uh, blockade runners ended up being uh, among the most effective blockaders. Did the U.S. Navy ever give any thought, uh, any effort to um, designing and, and building purpose-made blockade blockaders? Well, they did. They did build a couple of classes of that, but you know they could only build so many. Uh, it's just they, you know, they, they were, it was easy to take, you're capturing a number of blockade, uh, blockade runners, you might as well, you know, turn them into blockading vessels, but they did have a, have a, a few, uh, they had some sloops of war that were, that were very heavily gunned and very fast. Again, they had, their, their draft was a little deep, but they still, they made good blockading vessels, and there were some off of Wilmington later in the war. Ordinary 
You talking about the officers or, or the men? Well, a lot of them come from the merchant service, you know, just the enlisted men come from merchant service or, just, you know, they just, they train them on ship. I mean, some of them come on, come aboard and they, you know, they train, they do go, most of them go to a receiving ship for a, for a short while and they can give them a little bit of training there, but then they come on, come on these Navy ships pretty uh, raw in, in, in a lot of cases. Wondering if you could maybe summarize the other major ports and was the Gulf closed off first, like Mobile and New Orleans, and then went sort of up to the north, or is that? No, uh, the Mobile. Savannah, those are the well, Mobile stays in, in activity till it is a valid, uh, valid port until August of 1864 when, when Farragut steams into the you know, past the Fort Morgan and gets in, inside the harbor. Once he gets outside the harbor, the blockade running is done. Now, Galveston was open till the very last part of the war. It was open till the last elements of, of the uh, Confederacy surrendered in that part of the, you know, part of Texas. Uh, Beaufort went like right away. Yeah, Beaufort was 1862. Uh, and, you know, Savannah was, was uh, uh, they didn't capture Fort, uh, Fort Pulaski down there till uh, almost Christmas 1864, 1864. Uh, but th they had gotten vessels in the river. So that Savannah was pretty much shut down to any major trade. Now, a lot of, a lot of small schooners ran in there, but nothing, no major steam vessels were able to run in there after uh, about mid 1862. Uh, and Charleston stayed, uh, you know, until it was, uh, until it was uh, captured and and what was February 1865? So, yeah, well, I mean, they, but they, yeah, but uh, they ran once they got around it. It was, you know, no, not valuable as a port anymore. It was no, not viable. The problem with Charleston was there was one way in, there was one way out. Yeah. Yeah. But like New Orleans was the yeah. biggest port in the South by far. Yeah, it was captured in 1862. Yeah. Bob, yeah. could you comment on uh, difficulties in trying to post ships outside of Bermuda? I mean, it would have been, Bermuda would have been very effective if you could have stationed ships outside Bermuda. But that, it kind of goes against international blockading, uh, uh, what would you call it? Not, it's not law, but international law, you know, sea, the freedom of the seas. Uh, they did kind of, they skirted that issue during the war, but any, anything they captured had to be very, it was, had to be very careful, had to be very careful. And, it, and in fact, the United States Navy expanded the legal concept of the blockade greatly during the war, uh, much to the, uh, you know, the British would complain, but in their law, in their uh, overview of, you know, basically the largest uh, Navy 